Thank you, John. Uh, the hour is late, and you came here to hear Professor Peters and not I. I will uh, give him a somewhat shorter introduction than I'd originally planned. I won't be able to do justice to him, uh, but certainly some things need to be said. Uh, among the scholars working carefully on the interface between theology and science, uh, Professor Ted Peters is unquestionably in the forefront of this line of research. Uh, holding a PhD from the University of Chicago, he's Professor of Systematic Theology at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and also a Research Professor at the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences, also in Berkeley. He is a prolific author with nine books to his credit, two more in process, and well over a hundred published articles. He has made major contributions in eschatology, Trinitarian theology and ethics, as well as in the field of science and theology. In the field of science and theology, Ted has made major contributions in bioethics, particularly genetics. His recent book, For the Love of Children, Genetic Technology and the Future of the Family, arises from his participation in the important University of Chicago project on religion, culture, and family. He served as principal investigator for the NIH research project on theological and ethical questions raised by the Human Genome Project, which is the subject of next year's Nobel Conference. He is also conversant in issues of cosmology, physics, and theology, the subject of last year's Nobel Conference, and is currently editing a book entitled Science and Theology, The New Consonants. And in an era in which many pastors and church leaders are ignorant of, the, of science or apathetic about science, he shares these insights with future pastors in a seminary setting. I wish we had more like him. There is much more that can and should be said about Ted Peters, but the most recent is the most exciting. His book, Playing God, question mark, Genetic Determinism and Human Freedom, has just won the highly prestigious Templeton Foundation Award as one of the two best books in science and religion for 1997. We are very fortunate to have him with us here today. He will address us on coevolution, pain, or promise. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ted Peters. It's an honor for me to be here with distinguished scientists. It's also an honor to be working uh, with Richard Elvey. Richard, some years ago, stumbled on the secret, the secret that good science, good science understood as the honest pursuit of truth, good science is itself a godly activity. You don't have to paint it over with religion to think of it as divine. And so these Nobel conferences have taken a cocktail of science and spiked it with a little theology just so that secret could be made known. Now, I work every day in the field of science and religion, and when I think about the third of a century that Dick Elvey has put into his pioneering work, I think of him as nothing short of heroic. Stand up, Dick. There we go. It's nice to be here at Gustavus Adolphus and uh, reconnect uh, with my uh, collegial friend, Garrett Paul, and uh, to meet uh, uh, Andrew Carlson a senior who will be a future scientist and bioethicist. And I've met a number of you um, in the audience, but I think my favorite is a man whose name I've forgotten. But he came up yesterday and introduced himself and said, uh, I'm a pastor and I've just retired for health reasons. My congregation got sick of my preaching. <laughs> My topic is on coevolution, and I want to ask some questions, and I'm not absolutely confident that I have the right answers. But the basic question is this How is it that we in the human race can live at peace 
in a world where we're threatened with infection by viruses. Or maybe to frame it in a slightly different way, could the concept of evolution or coevolution itself provide us with some comfort in the face of suffering, the suffering that is caused by the invasion of a virus? Yesterday, John Holland said that evolution is a fact, not a theory, and he finds nature understood in Darwinian terms to be beautiful. And there's no doubt that the theory of evolution provides a rich and fruitful research program for science. But let me just go one step further and ask, is there enough there to found a spirituality? Is there enough there to deal with the deep human questions that arise in the face of a world of virus? Now, as you know, some people think of evolution as a fishy topic. And in Berkeley, where I come from, when we have ideological wars, they are fought on the backs of cars with bumper stickers and symbols on trunks. And as you're probably aware, the fish is a symbol for Jesus Christ. It comes from the ancient Greek acronym, ichthus, which is the word for fish. And uh, the oda is for Jesus, the chi for Christ, the theta for God, the upsilon for the sun and the sigma for Soter. Now there are in my part of the country, and I, there's at least one person here in St. Peter that don't exactly like this, and um, so we end up with another fish, <laughs> a Darwin fish, and you'll see those little legs there as it uh, comes out of the sea and uh, climbs up onto the evolutionary ladder. Well, one would expect retaliation, and there is. And uh, so <laughs> here we have a Jesus fish. Now, this is the chapter of the story where we currently find it. I wonder what will happen next month. This is the, uh, the UFO version of the evolutionary ladder. We all want to be on the top of the chain. But what I want to get at is the question raised by the relationship between death and life. And I took this picture on one of my Sierra Mountain backpacks. It's a dead and rotting sequoia. But as you can see right in the middle, uh, it is providing in its death nourishment for the life, the new life of another sequoia tree. Theologians have to ask that question. What's the meaning of death, especially when it appears to be a cost for someone else's life. Well, let's take a, a brief look at gene-gene coevolution. I certainly cannot add anything of substance scientifically to what has already been said in the last couple of days. Here's the influenza virus. And uh, those of you with really sharp eyes have probably noticed how Axel Stoyer has his trained squadron of flies that uh, come and have been hovering around, those of us who are uh, speaking. And I think that the purpose of the flies is to illustrate the viral swarm. But it all reminds me of a little poem my father had when I was growing up. He says, there once was a little fly named Enza. I opened the screen door and influenza. <laughs> this is a T cell in the process of dying due to the invasion of the HIV. Now, why do I have a picture of my front yard uh, with our cat and rabbit and um, Bill Yaklik alluded to the rabbit story in Australia, which many pick up as a kind of paradigmatic illustration of co-evolution. Uh, in the 1850s, uh, some British gentlemen introduced rabbits uh, into Australia for the purpose of supporting the hunt. 
but they must have been pretty bad shots because the uh, rabbits uh, grew in population and without any natural predecessors by 1950 there were just too many of them and so there was a cry for getting uh, rid of them and um, so they brought a rabbit virus from uh, Brazil uh, to uh, Australia, Mixoma. And within three months, as I understand it, that 99.8% of the rabbit population died, leaving only 0.2% remaining. By 1957, however, the rabbit population had returned, and it was now strong, and only 25% of those rabbits were now susceptible to that particular virus that through genetic selection we had a whole new relationship between the rabbit population and the virus. Could this be a way for us to look at the long story of human evolution and could we see such stories as the rabbits and countless other chapters in the human story as examples of moving towards a mutualistic symbiosis, a statistical symbiotic relationship between the human race and its viral partners. One such author who wants to think in this fashion says, a virus begins as a lethal attacker, yet given time it ameliorates its behavior through co-evolution until after many, gener many generations of both virus and host a totally new modus vivendi emerges, a true symbiosis in place of what was formerly a predator and prey relationship. I guess my question for this afternoon is to ask if that's the way it works, if that's the way nature works, and if that is what has brought us to this particular point in evolutionary history, what does it mean? Should we be learning from this? Should we be celebrating it? Or should we be looking for other sources in which to pose the question of human meaning in life? What I would like to suggest, at least by description, if not by prescription, that we human beings are more than our biological natures. We are thoroughgoingly physical, to be sure, but we are more than what we are physically. We are more than our evolutionary past. There are ways in which we as human beings transcend what has been given to us, what we have inherited. And we experience that transcendence in the form of freedom. And I would like to talk about two examples of freedom, two forms of freedom, Promethean freedom and spiritual freedom. And I'll explain what I mean by those. First, Promethea. You're probably familiar with the ancient Greek myth of how Prometheus was a titan at the time that the world was being created and that Prometheus saw that the world was in darkness. And up in the heavens he saw the gods enjoying the warmth and the light of the sun. And he thought, if I sneak up there and I light my torch on the sun and bring it back down to the darkness of earth, that we'll be able to light candles and um, bonfires and fireplaces and maybe we can make oil lamps so that uh, uh, people attending Nobel conferences at Gustavus Adolphus can have light in the middle of the afternoon. Prometheus was successful. It is both clever and uh, shall we call it Promethean adventure. He brought fire to earth but he raised the ire of the god Zeus. How dare Prometheus enter the realm of the gods where he ought not to come? And we must punish him for his arrogance, for his pride, for his hubris. And so Zeus uh, chained him to a rock where an eagle every day could come and feast on his liver. This is a Jap contemporary Japanese. Prometheus. Well, that's not where the story ends. The story continues because Prometheus had a younger brother named Epimetheus. And now if you take those names apart, 
you'll see that the word Prometheus means to think ahead. P-R-O means ahead, and Mothine is the verb to think. Prometheus was one who thought ahead. That's why he could anticipate the need that the planet Earth had for the fire of the sun. What about that name Epimetheus? E-P-I means what? After, right? Epimetheus means afterthought, and he was described as slow-witted. And Prometheus said, uh, you know, I think Zeus is kind of ticked off, so Epimetheus, be careful. If he sends you any gifts, don't take them. Well, Zeus sent Epimetheus a gift in the form of the first woman named Pandora. And Pandora was so beautiful that once Epimetheus laid eyes on her, he married her and took her into his house. But Pandora had curiosity, and she opened the box. And when she opened the box, out flew all of the evils of the world, disease and plague and war probably uh, those viruses. And when she slammed down the lid on the box, there was only one thing remaining in the box. Hope. Maybe Bob Gallo and the doctor's navel are still in that box because they certainly gave us some hope today. Well, <clears throat> Prometheanism is a form of freedom, it's a form of transcendence, it's a form of saying, I'm not going to accept the world as I find it. I'm going to move beyond it. And of course, Prometheans are highly criticized, especially in our own day and age, especially in the field of genetics. Why? Because that kind of transcendence can mean overstepping some sacred bounds. It can mean that nature or the gods will rebound, uh, rebound against us and punish us for our arrogance. Be that as it may, Prometheanism is a way of describing the sense of freedom that we as a human race find incarnate in the scientists who lead us forward. Let me give you a couple of examples looking ahead to next year when you're going to be looking at the Human Genome Project. A couple of the uh, Prometheans that I've uh, made contact with are here. This is Mary Claire King, who's a genetic geneticist, molecular biologist, formerly at the University of California, Berkeley, recently left to go to the state of Washington. Mary Claire has worked uh, for nearly two decades now on one highly focused project. She used to say, I'm going to find the gene that causes or that is responsible for inherited breast cancer in women. And she suspected that it was on chromosome 17. It was later proven to be the case. And she used to say, if I can find the gene for inherited breast cancer, and if I can find the switch that turns it on and off, and if I can come up with a pharmaceutical, that will keep that gene turned off. No woman in this country will ever have to suffer from inherited breast cancer again. Now that's Promethean transcendence. It's a way of saying we have inherited something from our evolutionary history, but our future is going to be different. Well, she wasn't the actual uh, first person to find the gene. Somebody else did, but because uh, the other scientists were relying upon her research, they let her name it. It's now known as BRCA, BRCA1. And you'll say BR, breast, CA, cancer, of course. But if you'll take a look at her uh, chart there, chromosome 17, you'll see that it's also Berkeley, California. No coincidence. I'd like to show uh, just two minutes of a film clip. And this will be of Francis Collins, who heads the National Center for Human Genome Research at the National Institutes of Health in Washington. And it comes out of a PBS special called Faith and Reason, which just aired a couple of weeks ago in the month of September. And in this clip, you'll see uh, Francis Collins, who will uh, give a testimony to his own faith in God, but at the same time say that faith mandates a responsibility that we as human beings have for human health and improving uh, human welfare. Uh, the voice, the narrator's voice, is that of Margaret Wertheim, who's the one who uh, made, the, uh, made the documentary. 
Could we uh, have this tape, please? Government has committed $3 billion for this effort. Research is coordinated at the National Institutes of Health by leading gene scientist and religious believer, Dr. Francis Collins. My own area of expertise is the genetics of human disease. I was fortunate to be part of the team that found the genes for cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease and neurofibromatosis. Uh, so I come at this from the point of view of somebody who would like to see the long list of human genetic diseases that afflict far too many people, understood better, treated, and eventually cured. As a boy, Dr. Collins attended an Episcopalian church, but in college, he became an atheist. At the age of 27, however, after reading the works of the English Christian writer C.S. Lewis, he was converted. I became convinced that this was a decision I wanted to make, and I became, by choice, a Christian, a serious Christian, who believes that Well, I think you can imagine what I described, right? <laughs> now, ordinarily, one does not put the Greek titan Prometheus together with Christian motivations for pursuing things. But I think that what we see here, both in Prometheus and in Francis Collins and in people of goodwill in general, and certainly the dedicated researchers in the sciences is on the one hand a great love and respect for the natural world of which we are totally immersed and apart, and also the sense of transcendence, that we have an obligation to use our science in order to make human life better, in order to relieve human suffering. And the laboratory science and medical research and the doctor's care all belong together. It's a form of freedom, freedom both in continuity with, yet transcendence over the natural world. As uh, we think about uh, the topic for this Nobel conference, I notice that there are a couple of uh, different sort of language games at work. One is coevolution, and as I've suggested, many people who like to think in terms of coevolution use language such as what? Mutual symbiosis, a kind of new harmonious relationship to be understood between the human and the non-human. And we also get what? Dedicated Promethean language that borders on the apocalyptic as we worry or con get ourselves concerned about emerging viruses and the threat that maybe, maybe a pandemic like that of the 1918 influenza virus might engulf the world one more time and shouldn't we get ready? Just reminds me a little bit of the, uh, these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse here from Revelation chapter 6, international war, and civil war, economic depression, and the pale horse. Uh, death, and we get uh, the warrior imagery and the fight against AIDS, defeating AIDS, what will it take? Uh, the war against the, uh, the microbes. Oh yes, there's a big distance from the lab bench through the media to how it is in the wider culture that we understand what's going on with natural science. But on the other hand, we've got genuinely got this double relationship. On the one hand, we are nature. We have inherited our natural past. Yet at the same time, there is a sense of transcendence, a sense that we, through our scientific research and through better health care, can have some influence on the evolutionary future of our own species. Well. I can't read it uh, because of the angle that I'm up here, but it's the suggestion that uh, some things in science are wrongity, wrongity, wrong. And the version of it uh, that, we're, uh, that we're getting in our own time is the fear of Prometheanism. And the fear comes in two forms. On the one hand, it's sort of the Sierra Club fear. Look, if we try to transcend nature too much, we will lose the sensitivity of being at one with the natural world. 
And then the second form in which it comes is the Frankenstein myth in its new versions. Namely, if we try to tinker too much, if we try to meddle too much with the essence of life, like Zeus strapping Prometheus to the rock, nature will fight back. Nature will fight back and it will come roaring back with great destructive force. So it's the playing God syndrome. Thou shalt not play God is the new commandment. And Jurassic Park becomes the way in which it appears on the movie screen. And so it's not as though science is wrong. It's the question our society is asking, is there a point at which we should put on the brakes? Is there a point at which the relationship between science and society itself ought to have some influence on the direction that science goes? My point here is not to argue for one policy or another, it's to say where we find ourselves as a human race is in a delicate situation of both being children of our evolutionary history and at the same time having a vision of transcendence that will carry us beyond it. That's Promethean freedom. Now let me turn to spiritual freedom. By spiritual freedom here, I'm not suggesting disembodied ghosts that fly around. No, I'm accepting and assuming that we are fully and completely physical beings. But by spiritual freedom, I mean what the theologian Paul Tillich meant when he said that freedom is being able to act out of a centered self to deliberate, to evaluate, to make judgments, to make decisions and take actions that come out of the centered person. We are more than our genes. We are more than our evolutionary history. We're, we are a whole, as a person, we are a whole greater than the sum of our parts. And let's take a look for a couple of moments at that understanding of freedom as we ask the question about human suffering. Now, while I was working on this paper to come here, the Jehovah's Witnesses knocked at my door. Actually, they rang the bell. And they handed me this, and did I want to buy it for 20 cents? And I said, yes, I've been thinking about this particular issue. And by the way, do you think God really does care for us? Oh, yes, he does, they said. And I said, good, I'll buy it for 20 cents. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. God does care for us, but the kind of a task the systematic theologian sets for himself or herself is to say, now just how does that work? What does that mean? How is it that we know that God cares for us? And there, the answer is not all that easy. Here we have William Blake's Job. Job in the Old Testament was a person who suffered did he suffer from a virus? Well, biblical scholars have looked at that. They think maybe it was a, a series of ulcers caused by a bacterium. Be that as it may, in addition to physical disease, Job suffered a number of social problems, such as losing all of his money and having his family die. And as Job's problems increased in their severity and in their length, he began to feel alone and he was in great pain, and he was angry, as all of us would get when we find ourselves alone and in pain and not being able to see any end. And he, like Dick Elvey a few moments ago, shook his fist at heaven. He complained, he says, my flesh is clothed with worms and dirt, my skin hardens and then breaks out again, like a slave who longs for the shadow and like laborers who look for their wages, so I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. No matter how bad it got, no matter how much Job suffered, we remember Job because he didn't give up. His wife said, Job, it's so bad you should curse God and die, and Job said, Naked I came into this world, and naked I will leave it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we can think of Job 
as one for whatever reason had the faith and the courage to maintain his interior strength in the face of horrendous suffering. Well, I think about Job, when I go over to the art exhibit and look at Sukho's depictions, as many of you have, of the, sufferer, the sufferers from AIDS. Yes, we must look at AIDS scientifically. We must understand how that virus invades and infects. But millions of people individually suffer the effects of that as they do with Ebola, influenza, and others. And they are left alone, tragically alone, to face their own pain and their own death. What does that mean? Some are stronger, some are weaker. All of us know that with the contingencies of life that any one of us could be in that situation at any time. And at one level, it looks as though a disease such as this will what? Wipe away our freedom as soon as we get the diagnosis. Yet we can observe that there are some people as centered cells who seem to be able to transcend it, take it into themselves, and make a decision, make a decision, so to speak, to face their own destiny with courage. Karl Rahner, the Roman Catholic theologian, calls this the liberty of the sick, the freedom experienced by a person who confronts death in a self-constituting way. It is best for us to die consciously, says Rahner, if it is possible. More than merely to suffer our death, we should paradoxically suffer it actively as an act of freedom. And because death has a way of stopping time, of making the end of our own finite existence, it functions to define us. Death is the final point at which we in our personal history on earth are finished. It is an achievement of freedom. If we in advance consciously take this finality up into ourselves and affirm ourselves ahead of time. This describes the Christian conviction that in death, a person's free history assumes final form. This means that the final judgment of the person takes place. To live is to live freely. None of this is easy. Yet we have to ask the question, where is it that human transcendence takes place? Is the statistical comfort of knowing that my death or the death of tens of thousands of individual alone and suffering victims of HIV serves a larger purpose of a mutual symbiosis of the, at a future stage of human evolution. Is that enough? seventeenth-century Spanish painting of a healing miracle of Jesus. The word for salvation and the word for healing come from the same shared root. And one thing that is very important, but still somewhat mysterious for me, is how, on the one hand, the ministry of healing, whether it comes at the hands of our faithful doctors, whether it comes at the hand of God directly, that the ministry, uh, the, the ministry of healing is something we feel physically, and we know that's what that is. We know how, how wonderful it is to be healed and liberated from a disease. Yet at the same time, our minds make a kind of spiritual jump that says that's not salvation. It's like healing, but salvation is something more than that. Because there are those rare instances, I don't know how rare they are, where a person does not get healed and still feels saved. What is it that makes that move? What, what is it that gives us that transcendent jump?
<laughs> There's no answer to my question, is there? <laughs> we have a backup. Let's see if we can find Jesus on the cross. We have a little help on the slides, please. This painting was painted clandestinely in Auschwitz. And those of you who know much about the Auschwitz history can recognize that the loincloth here is the um, blue and white checkered uniform that uh, inmates in Auschwitz had to wear. The artist died in Auschwitz, and it hangs now in a small town in southern Poland. A speculative question that people in my circle ask is the following. Granted that the debate between the scientific creationists and evolutionary theorists needs to be set aside and marginalized, and accepting what John Holland said, namely, evolution is the way nature works, could it be said that God uses the evolutionary history of the human race to accomplish divine purposes. Now that kind of a question is just shot through and through with dangers. The first one of which, of course, is that the scientific investigation of evolution presupposes no purpose. There is no purpose. Things are random. Things are unsupervised, the selection process. So you can't use purpose when you're um, looking into the subject matter. Another, what, danger lurking in that question is, is it God's purpose to produce beings or species which are more evolutionary fit than others? And the third danger is one that Charles Darwin himself alerted us to and almost did us a theological favor by saying that natural selection is without purpose. And please, you theologians, don't try to put purpose in here. Because he said, take a look at the massive amount of, human, uh, massive amount of suffering over the eons of time. That the cost in the suffering of sentient beings and species, entire species that have to die out is so great that if one wants to argue that God's purposes are being done through evolutionary adv advance, you'd have to say that either God is a very poor biological engineer or simply so apathetic, so unfeeling about suffering to allow it to occur on such a large scale. I asked the question, how is it that we, or we would know something about God in relationship to these matters? And I would like to point, at least to, uh, in part, to one small aspect of the gospel, and that's the sense that God manifested here in the suffering of Jesus Christ shares the suffering of his sentient creatures with them, with us. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. Jesus didn't get healed in this case. Jesus suffered, was unable to avoid it. I don't think that he's evolutionarily more fit than others, even though that's a debatable issue. And as I think back towards the long evolutionary history, where is God going to take a stand? With those more fit than others, I don't want to deny that, but I just have to ask, wouldn't there be some divine compassion for the victims, whether they be rabbits or whether they be humans? Martin Luther, in pondering the significance of the death of Jesus Christ, said it is correct to talk about God's death. It could be said God dead, God's passion, God's blood. God's death. I guess what I want to do without being able to answer all the questions is say, if this be true about God, when we look for the relationship between God and nature, 
there's going to be something about divine compassion that is going to be on the suffering side of the ledger. Finally, hope. There is, at least within the Christian vision and certainly within the Promethean vision, reason for hope. If there is a purpose within the long evolutionary history of the past, and if there is going to be a purpose in the evolutionary future of the human race and whatever it is that may transcend us in time, I think that purpose will probably come from the outside and not from the inside, from God's will and from God's future. The concept of coevolution co may be intellectually satisfying. It may be suggestive of further scientific research may even lead to a holistic picture of mutual symbiosis between the human and the virus. Yet it has a limit, I think. It simply cannot speak adequately to the profound existential need for us as individuals to confront the loneliness and injustice of pain, suffering, and death. Is there a promise of peace somewhere else? Perhaps. Some promise can be found in human freedom. But what kind of freedom? Promethean freedom holds out its own form of promise. For the human race as a collective, our research virologists and medical doctors and healthcare delivery institutions hold out promise that new vaccines and new therapies will save lives. Such past and projected medical achievements represent the triumph of human freedom. They represent transcendence of our natural history and they represent human co-creative power for influencing our evolutionary future. Yet, as respectable and glorious as Promethean freedom can be, I want to point out a counterbalancing freedom that only individuals can enjoy, and namely spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom places promise squarely within the pain and draws life from it. The promise within the pain is God and God's self, incarnate in Christ and spiritually present to us in our courage to affirm our true selves even in the face of the worst of adversity. Thank you very much. Story. We need a story. We need a uh, little yeah. ushering. Yeah. 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 You're rushing the stage. Okay. We're rushing the stage. Over. Okay. 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 Okay.
We're going to address questions to both the Navals and to Dr. Peters for questions. So we'll have a mixture of, of questions, I suppose, uh, a potpourri, potpourri of questions. Um, panelists, uh, speakers, do you have questions of either uh, Dr. Nabel or Dr. Ted Peters? Dr. Holland. I wanted to ask Elizabeth whether when you got regression of some of those nodules, did you see distant regression in uninjected nodules? Mm -hmm. uh, in one individual we did. Uh, there was a regression of pulmonary or lung nodules. And the hypothesis is, is that, as I explained in the, in the cartoon, when T cells T cells probably recognize other surface antigens on the tumor and then can act at distant sites away from, from the tumor causing tumor lysis or regression. There was a point that was uh, raised, I believe it was in uh, Dr. Gary's lecture, maybe it was your, I'm trying to remember, I'm looking at my notes here, on sterilizing immunity versus, I think it was what some of the HIV community says that perhaps it's not going to be possible to sterilize uh, against HIV as opposed to the so-called, uh, so that you know what I mean by sterilizing, when we were immunized against measles, we now have an immune response that's going to prevent the measles virus from establishing itself in the body. And with the sterilizing immunity then, is it possible to develop sterilizing immunity to HIV or at least if it is contracted to keep the virus in check? So perhaps between Dr. Gallo and yeah, in terms of HIV, we, we don't know yet, uh, obviously. The, um, I think the goal of any ideal vaccine would be to provide sterilizing immunity. And if you can't, you have to ask yourself, um, what, what is the trade-off? In some ways, I think by <laughs> lowering the viral load and, and making people less likely to transmit to others, that's good. But if, on the other hand, you convert the virus to a latent form so that it's not detectable, but then it can still be passed along to others, you could actually conceivably make the situation worse. So I think that in the case of Ebola, it, we're fortunate that at least in the models we've looked at so far, the immunity seems to be of the sterilizing sort. Uh, in, in HIV, uh, I think that uh, we, 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 we just don't know. Uh, this is for Dr. Elizabeth Nabel. Uh, how do you prevent gene rejection? Gene rejection. Since a foreign gene is inserted, is there going to be a problem? With the that, that's a good question. What, I think what we've learned uh, to date and from both some of the early cancer trials and also some of the early cardiovascular trials is that when you put uh, foreign DNA uh, into the body, um, the um, rejection or an autoimmune response against the foreign gene is actually reasonably minimal. There's a counterpart to that. We also, current, using our current vectors, we're really not able um, to achieve expression of the gene over a very long period of time. Some of that may be due to degradation of the gene and vector by natural enzymes, some of it may also be some degree of rejection of the foreign gene itself. Now, in some cases, if you're introducing the human gene for a particular protein and you already have that human gene in your body, you're probably less likely to reject it than if it's a completely new or absolutely foreign gene that your body hasn't seen before. And it's the latter that's the concept that we used in, in the uh, cancer cases. Gary, you have any comments? Well, um, I, I think that immune rejection is something that we have to reckon with in gene therapy. Um, particularly, it poses a serious problem for correcting inherited diseases where the gene may be missing. We're trying to replace it and it would be regarded as being foreign. Uh, 
And, and so I think there, and there are a number of strategies to pursue. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the firing line last night, alternative vectors, transient immunosuppression, incorporating features into the virus that would do that for us. Uh, it's important to recognize that in the meantime, there are many applications where we don't have to worry about that. The anti-cancer applications, we want to induce immunity. And in fact, with what Betsy presented on the uh, transfer of foreign MHC, it, it really is uh, the response we engender that creates the therapy. So the immune system is a double-edged sword, and we, we need to use it to our advantage when we can. And we will need to get more sophisticated uh, as we go down the road. Perhaps some of the audience wasn't, most of the audience did not have a chance to get the firing line last night, because here's a question about using alternative vectors uh, as opposed to virus. Uh, you, just, you just made a, a brief alluded, allusion to that, so I wouldn't mind expanding because somebody was asking yeah. about that. Well, it, that's a very important area for future development. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, um, the analogy that I've made to others in the past is that for, for gene delivery vectors, that in viruses and modified viruses, we're essentially taming what nature gave to us in the virus. Uh, whereas with synthetic vectors, we're building from, from scratch components that we think will facilitate gene delivery. In many ways, it's, it's, the analogy I like to make is it's, it's like taming a horse versus building a car. And uh, there are times, no matter how well you tame the horse, that it may get out of control. Uh, and uh, it, so I think that, that having the ability to assemble the parts is good but it's technically very challenging, and, and I think it's going to come as a second wave. It's already coming as a second wave, and I suspect we'll get increasingly more sophisticated uh, as we go along. With, with the virus, too, isn't there a problem with the immune response to the virus? Because I think that was a problem using adeno and delivery of the cystic fibrosis treating gene. Yeah, and, and it's, it's likely to be less a problem with synthetic vectors, although we are realizing now that even naked DNA itself can act as an adjuvant to the immune system, that it, it actually can stimulate immune responses. So uh, we, it will be a, the immune system will remain a challenge for both, uh, although I, I, I am hopeful synthetic vectors will offer improvements. Uh, now switching uh, to Ted Peters, the other end. What are your thoughts on what Stephen Jay Gould writes in his book, Full House, that evolution doesn't necessarily mean progress? Well, as, as I suggested, I think in my, um, my talk, I just assume that, that evolution does not necessarily mean progress, and of course that fits the theory that if it's random and if it's unsupervised, it does not necessarily mean progress. So is there another question hidden behind that one? No, I just, <laughs> perhaps we're asking some elaboration. Right. Excuse me while I read this. Well, I'll ask a question and I'll finish reading this, excuse me. Uh, in delivering genes, uh, someone in the audience wants to know, rather than delivering the gene, what would be the effects of delivering the uh, growth factors directly, the protein directly in the stent? Excellent question, and that, that is actually being done. There uh, are a number of, of trials going on where the uh, protein for the growth factor is being delivered instead of the gene. There are pluses and minuses to that. Um, Again, it's going to require delivery of the protein to exactly the site where you want to induce the new, new blood vessel formation, again, requiring some delivery catheters or devices. The potential disadvantage is that that protein has sort of a one-time hit or miss effect. It, it has its action, gets degraded, and gets excreted. The potential advantage of genetic forms of therapies, if you introduce the gene, then as I had mentioned earlier, get sort of continuous production of the protein. That's the goal, although with our current vectors, as others have said, we get somewhat limited expression of the gene, but often for some of the, the diseases that we want to treat, expression over several weeks or a month may be sufficient. And I suspect that probably in about two years from now, there are going to need to be head-to-head -head comparisons of giving, for example, VEGF by a recombinant protein approach or giving it by a gene approach for a particular disease indication. Okay. okay. Dr. Holland. Along those lines, I'd like to ask Gary, does that Ebola glycoprotein target exclusively to vascular endothelium or will it hit some epithelial sheets and, uh, to some extent? 
Yeah, the, uh, the, the characterization that we've done so far suggests that it has a preference for endothelium, but it's not exclusively endothelial cells. What, what seems to be remarkable is that uh, cells of the hematopoietic lineage, blood cells, T cells, B cells, uh, are not at all infected in contrast to the usual envelope of amphitropic uh, retroviruses, which infects those cells quite well. So it's a distinct pattern of infection, uh, and it's one that I think we can utilize. I think the other important aspect of being able now to uh, pseudotype with the Ebola glycoprotein is that it should allow us now to define the receptors, and several labs actually are very actively working. I have a, an ethical question that derives from the Nabel's work and, and leads also to uh, some ethical questions uh, in treatment of, of disease using animal models. The writer of I Want to Hold Your Hand lost his wife recently, and she was a great promoter of animal rights. And after her death, her, uh, Paul McCartney has asked that uh, people per give, money, give money for cancer research, but also give money for keeping animals out of research. Is that a Promethean? That's a sort of a Promethean question also in using animals for solving human problems. Let Ted take the first crack. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, an ethical decision algorithm, right? You have to decide in advance whether you're, whether you're going to use animals for research or not, and then once you have, uh, then, uh, then what follows? Uh, critics, those who are in favor of uh, animal rights over against uh, their use and experimentation will accuse us of being anthropocentric, that somehow or other we're going to treat animals as things, as a means for some kind of human end, and I think that's simply the case. And we'll have to either bite the bullet on that one um, or not. But uh, that would apply also to vegetarianism versus meat eating, it would seem to me, uh, across the board. I wonder, uh, for those who do animal research, you know, how you feel about it, um, is there a difference between a mere inanimate thing and an animal in research? Is there a level of respect that sentient beings get, even if they're being sacrificed for this much larger uh, purpose of human betterment? Um, would that satisfy the sensitive uh, among us or not? And I, I just don't know the answer to that uh, particular question. Uh, let, me, let me once again uh, ask this question again of you. Several years I was a member of the recombinant DNA advisory committee at NIH which controlled all the transgenic and so on experiments. And uh, for one of these meetings the president of the Animal Rights Society came and um, one of the things that was done then was to create transgenic animals, in other words, uh, and put human genes into animals, particularly human genes into mice. And he objected, he, the way he, he phrased it very well, I think he says, putting a human gene into a mouse uh, offends against the mouse's mouseness. <laughs> how, how, how would you, uh, <laughs> what would you say to that? Uh, that's, that's kind of the flip side of, um of what I would call the religious yuck factor that we find uh, quite frequently in uh, those people who cry playing God, uh, who want to say, we don't want transgenic animals on the grounds that the species ought not to be mixed in one fashion or another, and uh, that there's something, the assumption is there's something pure about the human species that ought not to be mixed up with the animals. So that's just kind of the, uh, the flip side of that. There are a couple of variants uh, on that. Uh, in scientific creationism, you get this doctrine that God had created the species in a fixed form at the beginning, and they never changed. This is the anti-evolutionary plank. I've never understood that. I don't understand where it comes from, but people do uh, seriously uh, believe that. Um, in a, uh, bio, for a biotech company that I had some contact with, Systemics, which is an AIDS research uh, company, um, they, they know very well that pigs are the best uh, experimental animals to be used, but the majority of the people on the board are Jewish. And they've elected not to use pigs uh, for their experiments, uh, but to go to mice uh, for uh, theological reasons. 
and uh, that kind of decision, uh, you know, needs to be uh, respected. Uh, but that's dealing with a very specific animal and not with uh, animals in general. Uh, finally, getting back to the mouseness of the mouse, which sounds so platonic, it's wonderful to see Plato alive and well uh, today, when we just take note that the chemical makeup of DNA is the same for a human being as it is for the mouse and for the rabbit you saw in my picture and for the poor squirrel that got caught in the transformer today. It's all the same DNA. And so sharp lines between what is a human being and what is another sentient being, those sharp lines are just not there when we think uh, genetically. So uh, I... Uh, at any rate, I would just say that uh, I'm, I'm not that worried about the mouseness or the mouseness or the humanness of a human when it comes to uh, genetic criteria. Well, in that particular experiment, I mean, mice are somewhat lovable creatures, I'm sure. Um, cat owners would object to the, to the use of cats. But what about, say, take it into cockroaches? Would, would one, could one use cockroaches, for example, for Well, we have the, we share the DNA with them, don't we? <laughs> I think the, the issue that we run into is that uh, when we're trying these highly experimental therapies uh, and these are being tested in people uh, for the very first time, uh, we, we need to do some, some sort of testing that makes sure that these approaches are safe. And, uh, you know, I, I think every scientist, I, I, and in, in at least that I know, uh, respects the animals that they work with. They treat them humanely. Uh, there certainly are, are guidelines for the care and use of animals. Uh, but I, I, I don't see that it would be possible to advance these new treatments were it not for appropriate uh, animal testing. You know, Gary, I think you could go even further. Every lot polio vaccine, every lot of yellow fever vaccine, every lot of measles vaccine is tested in the highest of the non-human animals that we work with, monkeys. And uh, I, the only alternative is to test it in children. Paul McCartney. Someone, uh, another question from the audience. If the quote answer comes ultimately from the quote outside, uh, for, in other words, God's purpose plan, then does it logically follow that the human race is in no serious threat of, its, of extinction? No, that doesn't follow at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you want a longer answer? I'll bet you. <laughs> well, Don't take the appendix out. Don't take the appendix out. <laughs> well, it's been an interesting afternoon. Some unexpected and some very new insights into uh, both the theology and the ethics of viruses as well as the use and of gene machines for delivery of therapeutic genes. We'll now recess. Uh, those who have tickets for the banquet uh, we, the doors will open at 6 o'clock. It's in the second floor of the student union called Alumni Hall. It's, the dinner will be served at 6.30. If, though, for those of you who do not have tickets for the dinner, we all will be coming back here, oh, 7.30, quarter of 8, for Dr. C.J. Peters' lecture. So you are invited to return here uh, for the evening lecture. Thank you for being here this afternoon.